Great. Can we have the middle screen and my and 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 the first slide up? Thank you. Uh, so. Actually, I need to be this side, don't I, so I can see all you good people at the back. That's very good. Very good. We'll, we'll try and keep the, um, the back room open uh, from now on, just to give us a little more space on a uh, second service on a Sunday morning, so that's very exciting. And, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that does to children's work, but I'm sure they'll sort something out. Today's Mega Kids Club, so that works really well. Anyway, doing a, a series uh, at the moment. Can we, can we d d do something about this one as well? Is that possible? Thank you. Um, doing a series, mini-series at the moment on time and money. And so this morning I want to talk about time and how we use time. And next week we'll talk about money and how we use money. Uh, so this morning, time. Time flies. If only I had more time. Where does all the time go? Today has been a real drag. Time is money. Slow down. If I could have my time again. And my favorite one is this. It's God has the perfect plan for my life. But right now, I am so far behind, I'm going to live forever. <laughs> it's been interesting over the last few years to uh, see how people's... Uh, Views of time and the way they use it has changed. When I was in my 20s, I don't recall anyone talking about work-life balance. Uh, there wasn't very much about personal development or strategic priorities uh, or implementing a paradigm shift going forward. Uh, the only people who had a five-year plan were the communists, and they were completely discredited. Uh, all we had was a diary and a to-do list, and, uh, and we just got by. But the reality is that the Bible talks a lot about time. And how we use our time. There's a great verse in Ephesians 5 that is really the, um, the, the text for this morning. And it's, therefore, be careful how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of your time. That's the NASB translation, which is often considered the most literal, uh, readable translation. Making the most of your time. In the NIV it says, make the most of every opportunity. And, and I find it fascinating that, that Paul says that and then in a couple of verses later he says, don't get drunk with wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So if you're going to make the most of every opportunity, if you're going to make the most of your time, then one of the things that we need to do is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit consistently and constantly. To, and as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, then we'll get into worship. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We'll get into fellowship. And that we'll speak to one another and encourage one another and bless one another with these words from heaven that we're singing and speaking over each other as we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Make the most of your time. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on. If you've got your Bibles open in Ephesians 5, you'll, you'll see that the next bit is all about submitting to one another. And specifically, wives to husbands, husbands to wives, to, to love one another. Children to fathers. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. He says, make the most of the time, make the most of every opportunity. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, in, get into fellowship and into worship. And then he starts talking about the family and the home and how we have a personal relationships with the folk that we love most dearly. And then in the next section, in the next section in Ephesians 5, uh, Paul talks about slaves and masters. Now, I know there's modern slavery and it's something that we're working hard to eradicate. But in our context, normally what we can do with that is talk about employers and employees. And in the context of make the most of every opportunity, make the most of your time, Paul says, if you're at work, then work as to the Lord. He's your boss. He's your master. And if you're the boss and the master, then don't exploit the people who are working for you. Look after them. Pay them their due. Make sure that they're cared for. Make sure that you're not exploiting them. And then the next section of Ephesians chapter, well, it's Ephesians chapter 6 now, although Paul didn't write the uh, chapter divisions, talks about what you stand for, who you are. He talks about standing, 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 and above all, stand. Stand with truth, because that's really important to you, your integrity. 
What you say, you want to keep that right around the middle of everything you do, like a belt. So it's your righteousness, the righteousness you've received from God and the righteousness that you're displaying in the world, that's really important. Who you are as a righteous person, made righteous by the blood of Jesus and displaying righteousness and justice and faithfulness in all the things that you're doing. It says be ready, be ready to talk about Jesus and to share the good news with your feet. What is it? Shod with the preparation of the something of the, of the good news. What it means is be ready to talk about Jesus. And you wear that like shoes. And then he talks about faith. Faith and faithfulness that's like a shield that protects you from the fiery darts of the evil one. Talks about salvation that guards your brain and your mind like a helmet. The knowledge of who you are in Christ, what he's done in your life and who he has made you. It talks about God's word from the scriptures and prophetically and through other people that's like a, a sword that we can take up and he does this whole imagery around uh, the armor of God but it's really about you and your character and what you're standing for what you're living for and right at the beginning it's make the most of your time be filled with the Holy Spirit make the most of your time in your relationships at home with your wife with your husband with your partner with your children your priorities at work and of course your character and who you are it's, just, it's as if Paul is saying these are your priorities to live well in these areas I think it was the CEO of McDonald's the story is slightly different if it's the CEO of Ford Motor Company but I think it was McDonald's uh, when he said that my three priorities are God family and hamburgers <laughs> but not necessarily in that order <laughs> if it was the Henry Ford it would have been God uh, motor car. But anyway you get the idea Stephen Covey his book I'm rereading seven habits of highly effective people as says that we need to schedule our priorities. To schedule our priorities, to stick them in your phone, to put them in your diary, mark them on the calendar. Because once you've worked out what your priorities are, and of course we would all say our priority is God, our priority is family, our priority is work. But when we've drilled down a bit, so that we know exactly what that looks like for the next month and we can stick it in our diary I, I started doing this many many years ago which is why you hardly ever see me on a Wednesday night because on a Wednesday night my diary says family night it's a shame because nowadays it's Maggie night because the family have all <laughs> the family have all gone they're not interested anymore but actually it's quite good it's quite good because it reminds us of times before we had family. So that's all very interesting. Your priorities change, don't they? Priorities change. You have a new grandson. Suddenly, you want to see him. It's very odd. Or a parent gets ill. Or there's real pressure at work. Or maybe you've just changed job. The priorities change. But what in the next month? What do you need to put in your diary? Because if it's in there, it's much harder to change it. If you write it in, time with Fred, when someone else comes along and wants that bit of time off you, you can say, sorry, I'm busy. Because I'm with Fred. Uh, that's really helpful. What about time with God? Maybe put that in. We'll talk later about Sabbath. What that might look like, put that in. Because it's much harder to move it once it's in the diary. And if you don't keep a diary, I'd suggest you start. So that you know what you're doing on Wednesday afternoon and Thursday night. Really helpful way of running 
are making sure that your priorities stay important, that we keep the most important thing, the most important thing. If you've been reading your Old Testament, um, you know, because you start the year sometimes, don't we, with reading the Bible through the year. So you won't have got very far into Genesis when you realize that God has built into this world, God has built into creation a, a rhythm of life. That our origin story, unlike the origin stories of most of the other Middle East, or any of the other Middle East and ancient uh, origin stories, and certainly unlike the, the scientific origin story that we have nowadays, uh, in our origin story, in Genesis chapter 1, we have a, a rhythm. We have a rhythm of, of, of life that God has built into the way that he has made us and made the world that we don't do well to ignore. It's very hard to cut against the grain on this sort of stuff. Right at the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, it says there was evening, there was morning the first day. There was evening, there was morning the second day. There was evening, there was morning the third day. There was evening, there was morning. There was a rhythm of creation. And, and we don't do well to ignore that. We don't do well when we work against that. What can I do? Evening, morning, that day that demonstrates my priority be, be, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What do I need to do each day to demonstrate that my wife, my husband, my children, my parents are priorities in my life? What do I need to do each day to fulfill my duties at work and do a little bit more than my duties at work? What can I do each day that builds my character, that builds truth and the knowledge of my salvation and a readiness to speak about Jesus and a righteousness in me? What can I do each day that fits that rhythm of life? It's really worth thinking about this sort of thing. It's most of you will know that for Old Testament people, for the Jewish people, the day started at sunset. There was evening, then there's morning. And, and I've tried to change the way I think about my days. It, it's really hard to do it, but, but the last three or four years, I've tried to just change, change the way I think about my days so that they start at sunset. One way you can do it is just the first time you notice it's dark, if you're like me and you work inside, often you don't notice it get dark. So the first time you notice it dark, just recognize the start of a new day. And, and it's, it's quite interesting to do that because you then, the first thing you do for the day is probably eat. And for me, that's the best meal of the day. And then after you eat, you probably relax. Or maybe you devote some time to fellowship in your small group or to service in some uh, ministry in the church. But maybe you go and visit some friends, but, but you relax. And then the next thing you do is go to sleep. And then the next thing you do is get up and acknowledge the presence of God and pray and ask him. And, and then the next thing you do is go to work. Because then you work out of that place of rest. You work out of the place of, of fullness, of relationship and friendship and worship and prayer. And, and you work out of that until the end of the day when it gets dark again. Then you stay. It's a very different way of thinking, but I recommend it to you. Try and work with the rhythms that God has put into the world, evening and morning. And of course, we want to start each day with prayer and thanksgiving and worship and which means each evening that we acknowledge God's presence pray for his fullness ask for good dreams pray that this day would be a really good one for the kingdom of God in my life what can I do each day to welcome the spirit to invest in my family to invest in my workplace to invest in my character what can I do every 24 hours <coughs> And at the end of, the, of Genesis 1, we find there's a weekly rhythm. That at the end of six days, everything changes. And then God rested from all his work. Uh, and we don't do well when we mess that up. Some societies have tried to impose a 10-day week, haven't they? 
And it's never worked. There seems to be something divine about a rhythm of seven days that's built into our human nature. What can I do each week? What can I do each week to that, that works with the rhythm of creation, that works with the rhythm of life, that shows that my priorities are being filled with the Holy Spirit and fellowship and worship, that shows that my priorities are family and close friends? What can I do each week that shows my commitment to my work? And to bettering myself and my career. What can I do each week that makes a difference to me and my character and who I am in Christ and as a person? And of course in the middle of all of this seven day rhythm of life, God has, has instituted a Sabbath. He says six days you shall work and on the seventh day rest. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how much you can lay store on this, but certainly when that was written, evenings didn't really count. That uh, the on the seventh day, the the work, the six days you will work, isn't seven o'clock in the morning till ten o'clock at night, because you can't really work after dark unless you've got electricity. And it may surprise you to know that electricity wasn't invented when the Bible was written. That after dark, or you can talk, you can pray, you can play, you can entertain, you can party, you can fellowship, you can worship. After dark, you can have a lot of fun, you can sit and relax, you can chill, you can do all sorts of things. But, but it's really hard to run a carpentry shop. It's really hard to mend a tent. It's really hard to mend the clothes. And so I just suggest to you and put it out there and see if you can work towards this. And some of you may, may already do it. But divide your days into three, morning, afternoon and evening. And then it says for six days you'll work. So 12 sections. That doesn't mean paid work. For, it, means, it includes paid work, but, but the DIY. The mending the fence. The doing the washing. The, the sorting out the priorities, all the, the work stuff, everything that would count as work in a nomadic community, see if we can fit that into 12 and then that leaves us a few other sections, doesn't it? And one of them will be Sabbath. <laughs> one of them will be Sabbath, where we just stop. We just stop. Maybe we can do, give out three sections, maybe together, maybe an evening and then a morning and an afternoon. Should be a Jewish way of doing Sabbath. Sabbath means stop. Sabbath means the world doesn't need you. Sabbath means you don't need the world. Sabbath means my mental health is important. Sabbath means I'm trusting God for the money that I could earn today that I'm not going to because I've stopped. Sabbath means I'm putting God first. Sabbath means there's more to life than activity. Sabbath means that being is more important than doing sometimes. Sabbath means stop. And the early chapters of Genesis, our origin story, reminds us that our focus is Godward. We're made in the image of God to reflect him. We walk with him in the cool of the day. We're made for a relationship. We're made for each other. It's not good for a man to be alone. Go fill the earth. We're made for work. or put us in the garden to look after it and to care for it. To create an environment where good things can grow. That's what work is, isn't it? Creating an environment where good things can grow. Whether that's a great department that makes a difference. Whether that's profits and the bottom line. Whether that's good kids who grow up to be fantastic citizens because you work in a school. It could be all sorts of things where you're, you're working to cause good things to grow. 
We were put in a garden to work it and to care for it, to make good things grow. So our work is important. And we're made for God. You've probably heard this story, so I won't dwell on it very long, but the professor who had the, uh, the pile of gravel, the, the five or six large stones, and the two cups of water, and he puts the gravel in the jar, in a jar, and he says the gravel is all the small bits of life, all the, the seemingly unimportant things of life. And the stones, the rocks, they're the important things of life. And he added, when he added them to the jar, they wouldn't all fit. So what he does is he tips, them out, tips it out again, and this time he puts the big bits in the jar first. And then, of course, he adds the gravel, and uh, he, adds <laughs> he adds the gravel, and this time it fits. And uh, everyone applauds and uh, says how wonderful it is. And then he says, so make sure that you put the big rocks in first. And then someone says, what about the water? And they all think he's about to pour the water in. He says, no, there's always time for a couple of drinks. <laughs> and that's, if you've heard that before, I, hopefully it's just a reminder. If you haven't, think about that because it makes a massive difference when we prioritize the important things. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, fellowship and worship. My home, my house, my close relationships, my family, my work my character and who I am and what I stand for. And we can do that by establishing a rhythm of life. A rhythm that works with creation. Use the time wisely. So each day I need to find time for God. I need to find time for family. I need to find time for my priorities. I need need to do that each day, each week. I don't know if you remember this MP who got into so much trouble a few weeks ago because he admitted that he spent an hour in the bath every morning. Do you remember that one? Uh, okay, none of us. We'll move on quickly. Uh, it's just the... Um, they slated him in the media because he, he spent an hour in the bath. And I thought, good on him. Good on him. Apart from the wrinkly fingers, I think it's an excellent, an excellent idea. And of course, if you're a Christian, he says he works in the bath and as well, which is fine. I, I, maybe too many bad images are going through your head now, uh, so we'll move on. But, but somehow find a way of spending serious time thinking, praying, reading, meditating, asking God to speak to you from the Scriptures, writing down what you're learning, reordering your priorities. It's not long before we get into the Old Testament, when we start to realize it's not just a weekly rhythm and a daily rhythm, but there's an annual rhythm as well. So three times a year, they would travel to Jerusalem for the feasts. And at the feasts, it would be a great festive occasion where they met all the extended family. They meet the people they haven't seen for a whole year. There'd be uh, Adonai, Adonai, Beli uh, Shirem, as we just sang. And uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That would be one of the things they shouted from the, the, um, the walls as you arrived in Jerusalem for the feast. And... And it was there that you ate together and you worshipped God and you re recognised Jesus, as the, uh, not Jesus, you recognised the, 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 the Lord your God was the centre of all that you had and all that you were and the hopes for your harvest and the thanksgiving for the harvest that's come and the prayers for the year and the necessity of atonement. And each three or four months you go up to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts. And there was an annual rhythm of seed time and harvest, of celebration. What can you do in 2018 that, that reflects those priorities? What can you do to create a highlight this year? So one of the things we're doing is we're taking my dad on holiday, which isn't a highlight for him because he goes on so many holidays, he's fed up with them. But... But for me, that's really significant. So last year we did it, and we're going to do it again this year. And Because and, I haven't been on holiday with my dad since I was 15. So that seems to be quite... So that's it's just working in the rhythm of this year. What can I do to invest in my family? 
I don't suggest that as a solution for all of you. Uh, you may not want to go on holiday with your father. I completely understand that. And, uh, but find a way. Find a way of a daily, a weekly, annual rhythm of life that invests in your priorities. Create highlights. Choices produce actions. Actions produce habits. Habits produce character. So the habit of a Sabbath. Maybe for you a Sabbath is getting up late. Spending a lot of time just thanking God and writing down a thank you letter to Jesus. Maybe for you Sabbath could start by going for a walk. And just walking with God in the cool of the day. Maybe for you it's texting five friends and just writing something of appreciation to them. Maybe it's spending an hour on the phone to your son or your daughter who you hardly ever speak to and that's part of your Sabbath. Maybe it's taking a couple of hours out to read the scripture and really ask God, what does it mean when Paul writes to the Philippians? What's he trying to say to them? What's he trying to say to me? Maybe it's a day when you turn off the phone. <laughs> Maybe it's a day when you turn off the telly. What's it look like? You have to be careful though. There's no rules in this. It's like fasting. There's no rules. I remember talking to one of my friends at age 15 who was brought up in a Christian home, which always seemed to me a very sad thing to have happened to the poor, poor lad. And because uh, I wasn't. And uh, anyway, he said, Sundays, he said, Sundays were so bad. It was worth going to bed early so that Monday would come quicker. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, be careful with this stuff. It's not do not, it's not do not, do not, do not. The Sabbath's made for you. Just work a way of doing it without being legalistic, without being bound to these things but do stuff that helps establish our priorities what rhythms are we building in what about our priorities how about this for a challenge if uh, if Jesus said the most important commandment was to to love God with all your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind and then he said the next is to love your neighbour as yourself. What can you build into a daily rhythm of life? What can you build into a weekly rhythm of life that expresses your love for God with all your heart? Your passion and your worship. What can you build in? Apart from coming here on a Sunday morning and really going for it in worship, what can you build into a rhythm of, of life daily and weekly that, that expresses your passion and heart for God? What about your soul, your prayer, your determination, your commitment, your will to, to honour God and to love him with all of your soul? Can you build that into a daily thing, a daily routine or a weekly cycle or an annual uh, retreat or something that, that demonstrates that you're obeying this commandment that Jesus said was the most important? What about loving God with all your strength? A way of serving, a way of ministering, a way of blessing other people, using, using the strength of your arm and the strength of your brain to, to invest in the next generation or to help the poor or to serve the needy or to do something that makes a difference for the kingdom. How can I love God with all my strength on a daily basis or a weekly basis? So it's within a rhythm of life that's starting to make a difference for the kingdom. Kingdom. What about loving God with all my mind, thinking it through, writing it down, meditating on it, reading about it? What about loving my neighbour? What can I do in a weekly basis, on a daily basis, in order to demonstrate the truth that I'm obeying this second commandment to love my neighbour? What act of kindness, what act of service, what, what way of blessing can I do every day? that makes a difference and obeys this commandment within the rhythm of life that I'm establishing. What can I do about loving my soul? Whoops, go back a bit. Go forward a bit. Go around a bit. Go. What's happened? I've done that one, done that one, done that one, done that one, done that one. 
Yay! What can I do about my, to, for myself in terms of a rhythm that helps me to rest and to care for myself and to improve myself, to, to be the person that God has made me to be? Maybe for some of us that means reading more books. Maybe for some of us that just means being still. Maybe for some of us it means commitment to, to, to smile more. Maybe for some of us it's a commitment to write down something about Thanksgiving every day. Whatever it is, what can I do? that will help me to stand, to stand, and above all, to stand. What can I do that means that I've got something to give to my neighbour? And of course, we do all of those specific things, all of those individual acts on a daily basis, a weekly basis, an annual basis, because it all belongs to him. When God says, I want one day in seven, it wasn't because he wasn't interested in the other six. It was as a sign that the other six were really important. When we take three minutes in our lunch break to, to pray about our colleagues at work, it's not so that we can forget about God for the rest of the day, but it's because we know that our colleagues are important to God all day. When we take 10 minutes in the morning to ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit and we wait on him, or we take half an hour to read the scriptures or whatever our habit is each day, it's not because then we've done that and we can close the door and leave it there and then go and do whatever we want for the rest of our life. It's because God is interested in all of it. We do the specific thing to remind us that the general thing is always true. That he always wants to love us. He always wants to use us. He always wants to bless us. He always wants us to make a difference. He always wants to connect with us. He's always got something to say to us. And so we, we deliberately set aside a bit of time where we can receive his love and his acceptance and his word. and His Because we want to do that all the time. I don't know what uh, frustrates you uh, in life, but one of the small things that frustrated me as a, as a parent uh, of very young children a while ago was just my dealing with, with these. I don't know if, you, if you've ever had problems with your children and oranges. It may just be me, but well, tangerines particularly, but, but there'd be a tangerine in the bowl, and, um, and as a mad act of generosity, I as a father who'd earned the money to buy these tangerines would occasionally, very occasionally, because I'm a pretty mean person most of the time, would generously pass one of these hard-earned tangerines into my daughter. <laughs> and she would gladly receive this gift and peel it and start to eat it. By this time, I'm thinking, I quite like a bit of that. And so I asked my daughter for one of the pieces of tangerine, to which inevitably she would say, no. <laughs> It's my tangerine. I paid for this thing. <laughs> Worked in other things as well. Ice creams, that was always another one. Sometimes God feels like that, I think. I've given you all of this. And it's all mine. One of the biggest things that will make a difference to our use of time is if we can see ourselves as full-time Christian workers. What a difference that makes in our workplace when we realize that we're there for God. That all of our time is His. I'm primarily here to make a difference for the kingdom. And I'm investing in things that last forever. I'm investing in love. I'm investing in the church. I'm investing in ministry. I'm investing in stuff that will last forever. Because it's all his. We're seeing things differently. Because it's all his. A 
I forget that one. Okay, I'm going to wrap up. What are my priorities now? Maybe you need to invest in your marriage. Maybe you need to give some time to your aged parents. Maybe it's time for children. Maybe it's time for extend. What are your priorities now? What's my spiritual rhythm now? Of course, that's tricky. If you're on shift work and it all gets messed up, if you're on a zero-hours contract, if you have to work three evenings on and then two evenings off, how can I establish a rhythm? Spiritual rhythm of connecting with Father and connecting with people around me and connecting with family. And What should I add or remove from my day, week, or year? What can I take out? What do I need to put in to what, how I use my time? And how can I remember that it's all for him? I remember a couple of years ago, um, I was talking to the lady who runs Slimming World here. And, uh, and she told me this frightening fact that if I lost a pound a week, by the end of the year I'd be three and a half stone lighter. I remember an astounding fact that Neil Hudson talked about when he came here. It says, if you change direction by one degree and keep going, you end up in a very different place. Let's pray together. Actually, Bala is Balaji in the room? Excellent. Balaji, do you want to help lead us in prayer? We're gonna, we are going to pray together. We're going to do, I um, haven't done that this, this, this year yet, but so good. We're just going to get into little groups of three or four or five. And, and pray in a little cluster. Please don't leave. It's not the end of the service. If you really don't want to take part, join a group and listen. And hopefully not everyone's got the same attitude as you have in the group. Otherwise, it would be a very quiet group. But that, that actually won't matter either. But it's been a delight to hear from a few folk. I prayed out loud for the first time last Sunday in a little prayer cluster. Or it was so good because I met someone and we committed to text each other that week and find out how we're doing. So just make the most of these next five or ten minutes as Balaji leads us.